Section 13 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 13. The Borgias, Chapter 6, Part 2. When, however, M. de Guise and M. de Tromwy found themselves pressed in this way, they ordered their two hundred men-at-arms to turn right about face, while at the opposite end, that is, at the head of the army, Maréchal de Guy and Trivulse ordered a halt and lances in rest. Meanwhile, according to custom, the king, who, as we said, was in the centre, was conferring knighthood on those gentlemen who had earned the favour either by virtue of their personal powers or the king's special friendship. Suddenly there was heard a terrible clash behind. It was the French rearguard coming to blows with the Marquis of Mantua. Where each man had singled out his own foe as though it were a tournament, very many lances were broken, especially those of the Italian knights, for their lances were hollowed so as to be less heavy, and in consequence had less solidity. Those who were thus disarmed at once seized their swords. As they were far more numerous than the French, the king saw them suddenly outflanking his right wing, and apparently prepared to surround it. At the same moment loud cries were heard from a direction facing the centre. This meant that the Stradiotes were crossing the river to make their attack. The king at once ordered his division into two detachments, and giving one to Bourbon the Bastard, to make head against the Stradiotes, he hurried with the second to the rescue of the van, flinging himself into the very midst of the melee, striking out like a king, and doing as steady work as the lowest in rank of his captains. Aided by the reinforcement, the rear-guard made a good stand, though the enemy were five against one, and the combat in this part continued to rage with wonderful fury. Obeying his orders, Bourbon had thrown himself upon the Stradiotes, but unfortunately, carried off by his horse, he had penetrated so far into the enemy's ranks that he was lost to sight. The disappearance of their chief, the strange dress of their new antagonists, and the peculiar method of their fighting produced a considerable effect on those who were to attack them, and for the moment disorder was the consequence in the centre, and the horsemen scattered instead of serrying their ranks and fighting in a body. This false move would have done them serious harm, had not most of the Stradiotes, seeing the baggage alone and undefended, rushed after that in hope of booty, instead of following up their advantage. A great part of the troop nevertheless stayed behind to fight, pressing on the French cavalry and smashing their lances with fearful scimitars. Happily the king, who had just repulsed the Marquis of Mantua's attack, perceived what was going on behind him, and riding back at all possible speed to the succour of the centre, together with the gentlemen of his household, fell upon the Stradiotes, no longer armed with a lance, for that he had just broken, but brandishing his long sword, which blazed about him like lightning, and, either because he was whirled away like Bourbon by his own horse, or because he had allowed his courage to take him too far, he suddenly found himself in the thickest ranks of the Stradiotes, accompanied only by eight of the knights he had just now created, one equerry called Antoine de Zambou, and his standard-bearer. France! France! he cried aloud, to rally round him all the others who had scattered. They, seeing at last the danger was less than they had supposed, began to take their revenge and to pay back with interest the blows they had received from the Stradiotes. Things were going still better, for the van which the Marquis de Cajazzo was to attack. For although he had at first appeared to be animated with a terrible purpose, he stopped short about ten or twelve feet from the French line and turned right about face without breaking a single lance. The French wanted to pursue, but the Maréchal de Guy, fearing that this fight might be only a trick to draw off the vanguard from the centre, ordered every man to stay in his place. But the Swiss, who were German and did not understand the order, or thought it was not meant for them, followed upon their heels, and although on foot, caught them up and killed a hundred of them. This was quite enough to throw them into disorder, so that some were scattered about the plain, and others made a rush for the water, so as to cross the river and rejoin their camp. When the Maréchal de Guise saw this, he detached a hundred of his own men to go to the aid of the king, who was continuing to fight with unheard of courage, and running the greatest risks. Constantly separated as he was from his gentlemen, who could not follow him, for wherever there was danger, thither he rushed with his cry of France. 
little troubling himself as to whether he was followed or not. And it was no longer with his sword that he fought, that he had long ago broken, like his lance, but with a heavy battle-axe, whose every blow was mortal, whether cut or pierced. Thus the Stradiotes, already hard-pressed by the king's household and his pensioners, soon changed attack for defence, and defence for flight. It was at this moment that the king was really in the greatest danger, for he had let himself be carried away in pursuit of the fugitives, and presently found himself all alone, surrounded by these men, who, had they not been struck with a mighty terror, would have had nothing to do but unite and crush him and his horse together. But, as Comine remarks, he whom God guards is well guarded, and God was guarding the king of France. All the same, at this moment, the French were sorely pressed in the rear, and although de Guise and de la Tromwy held out as firmly as it was possible to hold, they would probably have been compelled to yield to superior numbers had not a double aid arrived in time. First the indefatigable Charles, who, having nothing more to do amongst the fugitives, once again dashed into the midst of the fight. Next the servants of the army, who, now that they were set free from the Stradiotes and saw their enemies put to flight, ran up armed with the axes they habitually used to cut down wood for building their huts. They burst into the middle of the fray, slashing at the horses' legs and dealing heavy blows that smashed in the visors of the dismounted horsemen. The Italians could not hold out against this double attack. The Furia Francese rendered all their strategy and all their calculations useless, especially as for more than a century they had abandoned their fights of blood and fury for a kind of tournament they chose to regard as warfare. So, in spite of all Gonzaga's efforts, they turned their backs upon the French rear and took to flight. In the greatest haste and with much difficulty they recrossed the torrent, which was swollen even more now by the rain that had been falling during the whole time of the battle. Some thought fit to pursue the vanquished, for there was now such disorder in their ranks that they were fleeing in all directions from the battlefield where the French had gained so glorious a victory, blocking up the roads to Palma and Bercetto. But Marshal de Guy and de Guise and de Tronwy, who had done quite enough to save them from the suspicion of quailing before imaginary dangers, put a stop to this enthusiasm, by pointing out that it would only be risking the loss of their present advantage if they tried to push it farther with men and horses so worn out. This view was adopted in spite of the opinion of Trevulse, Camillo Vitelli, and Francesco Secco, who were all eager to follow up the victory. The king retired to a little village on the left bank of the Taro, and took shelter in a poor house. There he disarmed, being perhaps among all the captains and all the soldiers the man who had fought best. During the night the torrent swelled so high the Italian army could not have pursued, even if they had laid aside their fears. The king did not propose to give the appearance of fight after a victory, and therefore kept his army drawn up all day, and at night went on to sleep at Medesano, a little village only a mile lower down than the hamlet where he rested after the fight but in the course of the night he reflected that he had done enough for the honour of his arms in fighting an army four times as great as his own, and killing three thousand men, and then waiting a day and a half to give them time to take their revenge. So two hours before daybreak he had the fires lighted, that the enemy might suppose he was remaining in camp, and every man mounting noiselessly, the whole French army, almost out of danger by this time, proceeded on their march to Borgo San Donino. While this was going on, the Pope returned to Rome, where news highly favourable to his schemes was not slow to reach his ears. He learned that Ferdinand had crossed from Sicily into Calabria with six thousand volunteers and a considerable number of Spanish horse and foot, led, at the command of Ferdinand and Isabella, by the famous Gonzalo de Cordova, who arrived in Italy with a great reputation, destined to suffer somewhat from the defeat at Seminara. At almost the same time the French fleet had been beaten by the Aragonese. Moreover, the Battle of the Taro, though a complete defeat for the Confederates, was another victory for the Pope, because its result was to open a return to France for that man whom he regarded as his deadliest foe. So, feeling that he had nothing more to fear from Charles, he sent him a brief at Turin, where he had stopped for a short time to give aid to Navarra, therein commanding him, by virtue of his pontifical authority, to depart out of Italy with his army, and to recall within ten days those of his troops that still remained in the kingdom of Naples, on pain of excommunication, and a summons to appear before him in person. Charles the Eighth replied, 1. That he did not understand how the Pope, the chief of the League, 
ordered him to leave Italy, whereas the Confederates had not only refused him a passage, but had even attempted, though unsuccessfully, as perhaps His Holiness knew, to cut off his return into France. 2. That as to recalling his troops from Naples, he was not so irreligious as to do that, since they had not entered the kingdom without the consent and blessing of His Holiness. 3. That he was exceedingly surprised that the Pope should require his presence in person at the capital of the Christian world just at the present time, when six weeks previously, at the time of his return from Naples, although he ardently desired an interview with His Holiness, that he might offer proofs of his respect and obedience, His Holiness, instead of according this favour, had quitted Rome so hastily on his approach that he had not been able to come up with him by any efforts whatsoever. On this point, however, he promised to give His Holiness the satisfaction he desired, if he would engage this time to wait for him. He would therefore return to Rome as soon as the affairs that brought him back to his own kingdom had been satisfactorily settled. Although in this reply there was a touch of mockery and defiance, Charles was none the less compelled by the circumstances of the case to obey the Pope's strange brief. His presence was so much needed in France that, in spite of the arrival of a Swiss reinforcement, he was compelled to conclude a peace with Ludovicus Forza, whereby he yielded Novara to him, while Gilbert de Montpensier and de Aubigny, after defending, inch by inch, Calabria, the Basilicate, and Naples, were obliged to sign the capitulation of Attila after a siege of thirty-two days, on the 20th of July, 1496. This involved giving back to Ferdinand II, King of Naples, all the palaces and fortresses of his kingdom, which indeed he did but enjoy for three months, dying of exhaustion on the 7th of September following at the Castello della Somma at the foot of Vesuvius. All the attentions lavished upon him by his young wife could not repair the evil that her beauty had wrought. His uncle Frederick succeeded, and so, in the three years of his papacy, Alexander the Sixth had seen five kings upon the throne of Naples, while he was establishing himself more firmly upon his own pontifical seat. Ferdinand I, Alfonso I, Charles VIII, Ferdinand II, and Frederick. All this agitation about his throne, the rapid succession of sovereigns, was the best thing possible for Alexander, for each new monarch became actually king only on condition of his receiving the pontifical investiture. The consequence was that Alexander was the only gainer in power and credit by these changes, for the Duke of Milan and the Republics of Florence and Venice had successively recognized him as supreme head of the Church, in spite of his simony. Moreover, the five kings of Naples had in turn paid him homage. So he thought the time had now come for founding a mighty family, and for this he relied upon the Duke of Gandia, who was to hold all the highest temporal dignities, and upon Caesar Borgia, who was to be appointed to all the great ecclesiastical offices. The Pope made sure of the success of these new projects by electing four Spanish cardinals, who brought up the number of his compatriots in the sacred college to twenty-two, thus assuring him a constant and certain majority. The first requirement of the Pope's policy was to clear away from the neighbourhood of Rome all those petty lords whom most people call vicars of the church, but whom Alexander called the shackles of the papacy. We saw that he had already begun this work by rousing the Orsini against the Colonna family, when Charles the Eighth enterprise compelled him to concentrate all his mental resources, and also all the forces of his state, so as to secure his own personal safety. It had come about, through their own imprudent action, that of the Orsini, the Pope's old friends, were now in the pay of the French, and had entered the kingdom of Naples with them, where one of them, Virginio, a very important member of their powerful house, had been taken prisoner during the war, and was Ferdinand II's captive. Alexander could not let this opportunity escape him, so, first ordering the King of Naples not to release a man who, ever since the 1st of June 1496, had been a declared rebel, he pronounced a sentence of confiscation against Virginia Orsini and his whole family in a secret consistory, which sat on the 26th of October following, that is to say, in the early days of the reign of Frederick whom he knew to be entirely at his command, owing to the king's great desire of getting the investiture from them. Then, as it was not enough to declare the goods confiscated without also dispossessing the owners, he made overtures to the Colonna family, saying he would commission them, in proof of their new bond of friendship, to execute the order given against their old enemies under the direction of his son Francesco, Duke of Gandia. In this fashion he contrived to weaken his neighbours each by means of the other, till such time as he could safely attack and put an end to conquered and conqueror alike. 
the Colonna family accepted this proposition, and the Duke of Gandia was named General of the Church. His father, in his pontifical robes, bestowed on him the insignia of this office in the Church of St. Peter's at Rome. End of section number 13. Section 14 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 14. The Borgias. Chapter 7, Part 1 Matters went forward as Alexander had wished, and before the end of the year the pontifical army had seized a great number of castles and fortresses that belonged to the Orsini, who thought themselves already lost when Charles the Eighth came to the rescue. They had addressed themselves to him without much hope that he could be of real use to them, with his want of armed troops and his preoccupation with his own affairs. He, however, sent Carlo Orsini, son of Virginio the prisoner, and Vitellozzo Vitelli, brother of Camillo Vitelli, one of the three valiant Italian condottieri who had joined him and fought for him at the crossing of the Taro. These two captains, whose courage and skill were well known, brought with them a considerable sum of money from the liberal coffers of Charles the Eighth. Now scarcely had they arrived at Cita di Castello, the centre of their little sovereignty, and expressed their intention of raising a band of soldiers, when men presented themselves from all sides to fight under their banner. So they very soon assembled a small army, and, as they had been able during their stay among the French, to study those matters of military organization in which France excelled, they now applied the result of their learning to their own troops. The improvements were mainly certain changes in the artillery which made their maneuvers easier, and the substitution for their ordinary weapons of pikes similar in form to the Swiss pikes, but two feet longer. These changes effected, Vitellozzo Vitelli spent three or four months in exercising his men in the management of their new weapons. Then, when he thought them fit to make good use of these, and when he had collected more or less help from the towns of Perugia, Todi, and Narni, where the inhabitants trembled lest their turn should come after the Orsinis, as the Orsinis had followed on the Colonnas, he marched towards Bracciano, which was being besieged by the Duke of Urbino, who had been lent to the Pope by the Venetians in virtue of the treaty quoted above. The Venetian general, when he heard of Vitelli's approach, thought he might as well spare him half his journey, and marched out to confront him. The two armies met in the Soriano road, and the battle straightway began. The pontifical army had a body of eight hundred Germans, on which the dukes of Urbino and Gandia chiefly relied, as well they might, for they were the best troops in the world. But Vitelli attacked these picked men with his infantry, who, armed with their formidable pikes, ran them through, while they, with arms four feet shorter, had no chance even of returning the blows they received. At the same time Vitelli's light troops wheeled upon the flank, following their most rapid movements, and silencing the enemy's artillery by the swiftness and accuracy of their attack. The pontifical troops were put to flight, though after a longer resistance than might have been expected when they had to sustain the attack of an army so much better equipped than their own. With them they bore to Ronsiglioni, the Duke of Gandia, wounded in the face by a pike thrust, Fabrizia Colonna, and the envoy. The Duke of Urbino, who was fighting in the rear to aid the retreat, was taken prisoner with all his artillery and the baggage of the conquered army. But this success, great as it was, did not so swell the pride of Vitellozzo Vitelli as to make him oblivious of his position. 
he knew that he and the orsini together were too weak to sustain a war of such magnitude that the little store of money to which he owed the existence of his army would very soon be expended and his army would disappear with it so he hastened to get pardoned for the victory by making propositions which he would very likely have refused had he been the vanquished party and the pope accepted his conditions without demur during the interval having heard that trivulce had just recrossed the alps and re-entered italy with three thousand swiss and fearing lest the italian general might only be the advance guard of the king of france so it was settled that the Orsini should pay seventy thousand florins for the expenses of the war, and that all the prisoners on both sides should be exchanged without ransom, with the single exception of the Duke of Urbino. As a pledge for the future payment of the seventy thousand florins, the Orsini handed over to the cardinals Sforza and San Severino the fortresses of Anguillara and Servetri. Then, when the day came and they had not the necessary money, they gave up their prisoner, the Duke of Urbino, estimating his worth at forty thousand ducats, nearly all the sum required, and handed him over to Alexander on account. He, a rigid observer of engagements, made his own general, taken prisoner in his service, pay to himself the ransom he owed to the enemy. Then the Pope had the corpse of Virginio sent to Carlo Orsini and Vitellozzo Vitelli, as he could not send him alive. By a strange fatality the prisoner had died, eight days before the treaty was signed, of the same malady, at least if we may judge by analogy, that had carried off Bajazet's brother. As soon as the peace was signed, Prospero Colonna and Gonzalvo de Cordova whom the Pope had demanded from Frederick, arrived at Rome with an army of Spanish and Neapolitan troops. Alexander, as he could not utilize these against the Orsini, set them the work of recapturing Ostia, not desiring to incur the reproach of bringing them to Rome for nothing. Gonzalvo was rewarded for this feat by receiving the rose of gold from the Pope's hand, that being the highest honor his holiness can grant he shared this distinction with the emperor maximilian the king of france the doge of venice and the marquis of mantua in the midst of all this occurred the solemn festival of the assumption in which gonzalvo was invited to take part he accordingly left his palace proceeded in great pomp in the front of the pontifical cavalry and took his place on the Duke of Gandia's left hand. The Duke attracted all eyes by his personal beauty, set off as it was by all the luxury he thought fit to display at this festival. He had a retinue of pages and servants clad in sumptuous liveries, incomparable for richness with anything heretofore seen in Rome, that city of religious pomp. All these pages and servants rode magnificent horses caparisoned in velvet, trimmed with silver fringe, and bells of silver hanging down every here and there. He himself was in a robe of gold brocade, and wore at his neck a string of eastern pearls, perhaps the finest and largest that ever belonged to a Christian prince, while on his cap was a gold chain studded with diamonds, of which the smallest was worth more than twenty thousand ducats. This magnificence was all the more conspicuous by the contrast it presented to Caesar's dress, whose scarlet robe admitted of no ornaments. The result was that Caesar, doubly jealous of his brother, felt a new hatred rise up within him when he heard all along the way the praises of his fine appearance and noble equipment. From this moment Cardinal Valentino decided in his own mind the fate of this man, this constant obstacle in the path of his pride, his love, and his ambition. Very good reason, says Tommaso the historian, had the Duke of Gandia to leave behind him an impression on the public mind of his beauty and his grandeur at this fate. 
for this last display was soon to be followed by the obsequies of the unhappy young man. Lucrezia also had come to Rome on the pretext of taking part in the solemnity, but really, as we shall see later, with the view of serving as a new instrument for her father's ambition. As the Pope was not satisfied with an empty triumph of vanity and display for his son, and as his war with the Orsini had failed to produce the anticipated results, he decided to increase the fortune of his firstborn by doing the very thing which he had accused Calixtus in his speech of doing for him, viz., alienating from the states of the church the cities of Benevento, Terracino, and Ponticorvo to form a duchy as an appanage to his son's house. Accordingly, this proposition was put forward in a full consistory, and, as the College of Cardinals was entirely Alexander's, there was no difficulty about carrying his point. This new favor to his elder brother exasperated Caesar, although he was himself getting a share of the paternal gifts, for he had just been named envoy a la terre at Frederick's court, and was appointed to crown him with his own hands as the papal representative. But Lucrezia, when she had spent a few days of pleasure with her father and brothers, had gone into retreat at the convent of San Sisto. No one knew the real motive of her seclusion, and no entreaties of Caesar, whose love for her was strange and unnatural, had induced her to defer this departure from the world even until the day after he left for Naples. His sister's obstinacy wounded him deeply, for ever since the day when the Duke of Gandia had appeared in the procession so magnificently attired, he fancied he had observed a coldness in the mistress of his illicit affection, and so far did this increase his hatred of his rival that he resolved to be rid of him at all costs. So he ordered the chief of his Sibiri to come and see him the same night. Michelotto was accustomed to these mysterious messages, which almost always meant his help was wanted in some love affair or some act of revenge. As in either case his reward was generally a large one, he was careful to keep his engagement, and at the appointed hour was brought into the presence of his patron. Caesar received him leaning against a tall chimney-piece, no longer wearing his cardinal's robe and hat, but a doublet of black velvet slashed with satin of the same color. One hand toyed mechanically with his gloves, while the other rested on the handle of a poisoned dagger which never left his side. This was the dress he kept for his nocturnal expeditions, so Michelotto felt no surprise at that. But his eyes burned with a flame more gloomy than their wont, and his cheeks, generally pale, were now livid. Michelotto had but to cast one look upon his master to see that Caesar and he were about to share some terrible enterprise. He signed to him to shut the door. Michelotto obeyed. Then, after a moment's silence, during which the eyes of Borgia seemed to burn into the soul of the bravo, who, with a careless air, stood bareheaded before him, he said, in a voice whose slightly mocking tone gave the only sign of his emotion, Michelotto, how do you think this dress suits me? Accustomed as he was to his master's tricks of circumlocution, the bravo was so far from expecting this question that at first he stood mute, and only after a few moments' pause was able to say, "'Admirably, Monsignore. Thanks to the dress, your Excellency has the appearance as well as the true spirit of a captain.' "'I am glad you think so,' replied Cesar. "'And now let me ask you, do you know who is the cause that instead of wearing this dress, which I can only put on at night, I am forced to disguise myself in the daytime in a cardinal's robe and hat, and pass my time trotting about from church to church?' from consistory to consistory, when I ought properly to be leading a magnificent army in the battlefield, where you would enjoy a captain's rank, instead of being the chief of a few miserable sbiri. 
"'Yes, Monsignore,' replied Micheloto, who had divined Cesar's meaning at his first word. "'The man who is the cause of this is Francesco, Duke of Gandia and Benevento, your elder brother.' "'Do you know,' Cesar resumed, giving no sign of assent, but a nod and a bitter smile, "'do you know who has all the money and none of the genius, who has the helmet and none of the brains, who has the sword and no hand to wield it?' "'That, too, is the Duke of Gandia,' said Micheloto. "'Do you know,' continued Cesar, "'who is the man whom I find continually blocking the path of my ambition?' my fortune and my love it is the same the duke of gandia said micheloto and what do you think of it asked cesar i think he must die replied the man coldly that is my opinion also micheloto said cesar stepping towards him and grasping his hand and my only regret is that i did not think of it sooner for if I had carried a sword at my side instead of a crozier in my hand when the King of France was marching through Italy, I should now have been the master of a fine domain. The Pope is obviously anxious to aggrandize his family, but he is mistaken in the means he adopts. It is I who ought to have been made Duke, and my brother a Cardinal. There is no doubt at all that had he made me Duke, I should have contributed a daring and courage to his service that would have made his power far weightier than it is. The man who would make his way to vast dominions and a kingdom ought to trample underfoot all the obstacles in his path, and boldly grasp the very sharpest thorns, whatever reluctance his weak flesh may feel. Such a man, if he would open out his path to fortune, should seize his dagger or his sword, and strike out with his eyes shut. He should not shrink from bathing his hands in the blood of his kindred. He should follow the example offered him by every founder of empire, from Romulus to Bajazet, both of whom climbed to the throne by the ladder of fratricide. Yes, Micheloto, as you say, such is my condition, and I am resolved I will not shrink. Now you know why I sent for you. Am I wrong in counting upon you? As might have been expected, Micheloto, seeing his own fortune in this crime, replied that he was entirely at Cesar's service, and that he had nothing to do but to give his orders as to time, place, and manner of execution. Cesar replied that the time must needs be very soon, since he was on the point of leaving Rome for Naples. As to the place and the mode of execution, they would depend on circumstances, and each of them must look out for an opportunity and seize the first that seemed favorable. End of section 14「Chapter Seven, Part Two. Two days after this resolution had been taken, Cesar learned that the day of his departure was fixed for Thursday, the fifteenth of June. At the same time, he received an invitation from his mother to come to supper with her on the fourteenth. This was a farewell repast given in his honor. Micheloto received orders to be in readiness at eleven o'clock at night. The table was set in the open air in a magnificent vineyard, a property of Rosa Venoza's, in the neighborhood of San Piero in Vinculus. The guests were César Borgia, the hero of the occasion, the Duke of Gandia, the Prince of Squillas, Dona Sancha, his wife, the Cardinal of Monte Reale, Francesco Borgia, son of Calixtus III, Don Rodrigo Borgia, captain of the Apostolic Palace, Don Goffredo, brother of the Cardinal, Gian Borgia, at that time the ambassador at Perugia, 
and lastly Don Alfonso Borgia, the Pope's nephew. The whole family, therefore, was present except Lucrezia, who was still in retreat and would not come. The repast was magnificent. Cesar was quite as cheerful as usual, and the Duke of Gandia seemed more joyous than he had ever been before. In the middle of supper a man in a mask brought him a letter. The Duke unfastened it, colouring up with pleasure, and when he had read it, answered in these words, I will come. Then he quickly hid the letter in the pocket of his doublet, but quick as he was to conceal it from every eye, Cesar had had time to cast a glance that way, and he fancied he recognized the handwriting of his sister Lucrezia. Meanwhile the messenger had gone off with his answer, no one but Cesar paying the slightest attention to him, for at that period it was the custom for messages to be conveyed by men in domino, or by women whose faces were concealed by a veil. At ten o'clock they rose from the table, and, as the air was sweet and mild, they walked about a while under the magnificent pine-trees that shaded the house of Rosa Venoza, while Cesar never for an instant let his brother out of his sight. At eleven o'clock the Duke of Gandia bade good-night to his mother. Cesar at once followed suit, alleging his desire to go to the Vatican to bid farewell to the Pope, as he would not be able to fulfill this duty on the morrow, his departure being fixed at daybreak. This pretext was all the more plausible, since the Pope was in the habit of sitting up every night till two or three o'clock in the morning. The two brothers went out together, mounted their horses, which were waiting for them at the door, and rode side by side as far as the Palazzo Borgia, the present home of Cardinal Ascanio Sforza, who had taken it as a gift from Alexander the night before his election to the papacy. There the Duke of Gandia separated from his brother, saying with a smile that he was not intending to go home, as he had several hours to spend first with a fair lady who was expecting him. Cesar replied that he was no doubt free to make any use he liked best of his opportunities, and wished him a very good night. The Duke turned to the right and Cesar to the left but Cesar observed that the street the duke had taken led in the direction of the convent of San Sisto, where, as we said, Lucrezia was in retreat. His suspicions were confirmed by this observation, and he directed his horse's steps to the Vatican, found the Pope, took his leave of him, and received his benediction. From this moment all is wrapped in mystery and darkness, like that in which the terrible deed was done that we are now to relate. This, however, is what is believed. The Duke of Gandia, when he quitted Cesar, sent away his servants, and in the company of one confidential valet alone, pursued his course towards the Piazza della Giudecca. There he found the same man in a mask who had come to speak to him at supper, and, forbidding his valet to follow any farther, he bade him wait on the piazza where they then stood, promising to be on his way back in two hours' time at latest, and to take him up as he passed. And at the appointed hour the duke reappeared, took leave this time of the man in the mask, and retraced his steps towards his palace but scarcely had he turned the corner of the Jewish ghetto when four men on foot, led by a fifth who was on horseback, flung themselves upon him. Thinking they were thieves, or else that he was the victim of some mistake, the Duke of Gandia mentioned his name, but instead of the name checking the murderer's daggers, their strokes were redoubled, and the Duke very soon fell dead, his valet dying beside him. Then the man on horseback, who had watched the assassination with no sign of emotion, backed his horse towards the dead body. The four murderers lifted the corpse across the crupper, and walking side by side to support it, then made their way down the lane that leads to the church of Santa Maria in Monticelli. The wretched valet they left for dead upon the pavement but he, after a lapse of a few seconds, regained some small strength, and his groans were heard by the inhabitants of a poor little house hard by. They came and picked him up, and laid him upon a bed, 
where he died almost at once, unable to give any evidence as to the assassins or any details of the murder. All night the Duke was expected home, and all the next morning. Then expectation was turned into fear, and fear at last into deadly terror. The Pope was approached, and told that the Duke of Gandia had never come back to his palace since he left his mother's house. But Alexander tried to deceive himself all through the rest of the day, hoping that his son might have been surprised by the coming of daylight in the midst of an amorous adventure, and was waiting till the next night to get away in that darkness which had aided his coming thither. But the night, like the day, passed and brought no news. On the morrow the Pope, tormented by the gloomiest presentiments and by the raven's croak of the vox populi, let himself fall into the depths of despair. Amid sighs and sobs of grief, all he could say to any one who came to him was but these words repeated a thousand times. Search, search, let us know how my unhappy son has died. Then everybody joined in the search, for, as we have said, the Duke of Gandia was beloved by all, but nothing could be discovered from scouring the town except the body of the murdered man, who was recognized as the Duke's valet. Of his master there was no trace whatever. It was then thought, not without reason, that he had probably been thrown into the Tiber, and they began to follow along its banks, beginning from the Via della Ripetta questioning every boatman and fisherman who might possibly have seen, either from their houses or from their boats, what had happened on the river banks during the two preceding nights. At first all inquiries were in vain, but when they had gone up as high as the Via del Fantanone, they found a man at last who said he had seen something happen on the night of the 14th, which might very possibly have some bearing on the subject of the inquiry. He was a Slav named George, who was taking up the river a boat laden with wood to Repetta. The following are his own words. Gentlemen, he said, last Wednesday evening, when I had set down my load of wood on the bank, I remained in my boat, resting in the cool night air, and watching lest other men should come and take away what I had just unloaded. When, about two o'clock in the morning, I saw coming out of the lane on the left of San Girolamo's church two men on foot, who came forward in the middle of the street, and looked so carefully all around that they seemed to have come to find out if anybody was going along the street. When they felt sure that it was deserted, they went back along the same lane, whence issued presently two other men, who used similar precautions to make sure that there was nothing fresh. They, when they found all as they wished, gave a sign to their companions to come and join them. Next appeared one man on a dapple-gray horse, which was carrying on the crupper the body of a dead man, his head and arms hanging over on one side and his feet on the other. The two fellows I had first seen exploring were holding him up by the arms and legs. The other three at once went up to the river, while the first two kept a watch on the street, and advancing to the part of the bank where the sewers of the town are discharged into the Tiber, the horseman turned his horse, backing on the river. Then the two who were at either side, taking the corpse, one by the hands, the other by the feet, swung it three times, and the third time threw it out into the river with all their strength. Then, at the noise made when the body splashed into the river, the horseman asked, Is it done? And the others answered, Yes, sir, and he at once turned right about face. But seeing the dead man's cloak floating, he asked, What was that black thing swimming about? Sir, said one of the men, it is his cloak. And then another man picked up some stones, and running to the place where it was still floating, threw them so as to make it sink under. As soon as it had quite disappeared, they went off, and after walking a little way along the main road, they went into the lane that leads to San Giacomo. That was all I saw, gentlemen, and so it is all I can answer to the questions you have asked me. 
At these words, which robbed of all hope any who might yet entertain it, one of the Pope's servants asked the Slav why, when he was witness of such a deed, he had not gone to denounce it to the governor. But the Slav replied that, since he had exercised his present trade on the riverside, he had seen dead men thrown into the Tiber in the same way a hundred times, and had never heard that anybody had been troubled about them so he supposed it would be the same with this corpse as the others, and had never imagined it was his duty to speak of it, not thinking it would be any more important than it had been before. Acting on this intelligence, the servants of His Holiness summoned at once all boatmen and fishermen who were accustomed to go up and down the river, and as a large reward was promised to any one who should find the Duke's body, there were soon more than a hundred ready for the job so that before the evening of the same day, which was Friday, two men were drawn out of the water, of whom one was instantly recognized as the hapless duke. At the very first glance at the body there could be no doubt as to the cause of death. It was pierced with nine wounds, the chief one in the throat, whose artery was cut. The clothing had not been touched, his doublet and cloak were there, his gloves in his waistband, gold in his purse. The duke then must have been assassinated, not for gain, but for revenge. The ship which carried the corpse went up the Tiber to the Castello Sant'Angelo, where it was set down. At once the magnificent dress was fetched from the duke's palace which he had worn on the day of the procession, and he was clothed in it once more. Beside him were placed the insignia of the generalship of the church. Thus he lay in state all day, but his father in his despair had not the courage to come and look at him. At last, when night had fallen, his most trusty and honored servants carried the body to the church of the Madonna del Papala, with all the pomp and ceremony that church and state combined could devise for the funeral of the son of the Pope. Meantime the blood-stained hands of Cesar Borgia were placing a royal crown upon the head of Frederick of Aragon. This blow had pierced Alexander's heart very deeply. As at first he did not know on whom his suspicions should fall, he gave the strictest orders for the pursuit of the murderers. But little by little the infamous truth was forced upon him. He saw that the blow which struck at his house came from that very house itself, and then his despair was changed to madness. He ran through the rooms of the Vatican like a maniac, and entering the consistory with torn garments and ashes on his head, he sobbingly avowed all the errors of his past life, owning that the disaster that struck his offspring through his offspring was a just chastisement from God. Then he retired to a secret dark chamber of the palace, and there shut himself up, declaring his resolve to die of starvation. And indeed for more than sixty hours he took no nourishment by day nor rest by night, making no answer to those who knocked at his door to bring him food, except with the wailings of a woman, or a roar as of a wounded lion. Even the beautiful Julia Farnese, his new mistress, could not move him at all, and was obliged to go and seek Lucrezia, that daughter doubly loved, to conquer his deadly resolve. Lucrezia came out from the retreat where she was weeping for the Duke of Gandia, that she might console her father. At her voice the door did really open, and it was only then that the Duke of Segovia, who had been kneeling almost a whole day at the threshold, begging his holiness to take heart, could enter with servants bearing wine and food. The Pope remained alone with Lucrezia for three days and nights. Then he reappeared in public, outwardly calm, if not resigned for Guicciardini assures us that his daughter had made him understand how dangerous it would be to himself to show too openly before the assassin, who was coming home, the immoderate love he felt for his victim. End of section 15
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda. Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G. B. Eves. Section 16. The Borgias. Chapter 8. Caesar remained at Naples, partly to give time to the paternal grief to cool down, and partly to get on with another business he had lately been charged with, nothing else than a proposition of marriage between Lucrezia and Don Alfonso of Aragorn, Duke of Bicelli and Prince of Salerno, natural son of Alfonso II and brother of Donna Sancha. It was true that Lucrezia was already married to the Lord of Pesaro, but she was the daughter of a father who had received from heaven the right of uniting and disuniting. There was no need to trouble about so trifling a matter. When the two were ready to marry, the divorce would be effected. Alexander was too good a tactician to leave his daughter married to a son-in-law who was becoming useless to him. Towards the end of August, it was announced that the ambassador was coming back to Rome, having accomplished his mission to the new king, to his great satisfaction. And thither he returned on the 5th of September, that is, nearly three months after the Duke of Gandia's death, and on the next day, the 6th, from the church of Santa Maria Novella, where, according to custom, the cardinals and the Spanish and Venetian ambassadors were awaiting him on horseback at the door, he proceeded to the Vatican, where his holiness was sitting. There he entered the consistory, was admitted by the Pope, and in accordance with the usual ceremonial received his benediction and keys. Then, accompanied once more in the same fashion by the ambassadors and cardinals, he was escorted to his own apartments. Thence he proceeded to the Pops as soon as he was left alone, for at the consistory they had had no speech with one another, and the father and son had a hundred things to talk about, but of these the Duke of Gandia was not one, as might have been expected. His name was not once spoken, and neither on that day nor afterwards was there ever again any mention of the unhappy young man. It was as though he had never existed. It was the fact that Caesar brought good news. King Frederick gave his consent to the proposed union, so the marriage of Sforza and Lucretia was dissolved on a pretext of nullity. Then Frederick authorized the exhumation of James' body, which, it will be remembered, was worth 300,000 ducats. After this, all came about as Caesar has desired. He became the man who was all-powerful after the Pope, but when he was second in command, it was soon evident to the Roman people that their city was making new stride in the direction of ruin. There was nothing but balls, fats, masquerades. There were magnificent hunting parties when Caesar who had begun to cast off its cardinal's robes, weary perhaps of the color, appeared, appeared in a French dress, followed like a king by cardinals, envoys, and bodyguard. The whole pontifical town, given up like a courtesan to orgies and debauchery, had ever been more the home of sedition, luxury, and carnage, according to the cardinal of Viterba, not even in the days of Nero and Heliogabalus. Never had she fallen upon days more evil. Never had more traitors done her dishonor or sbirri stained her streets with blood. The number of thieves was so great and their audacity such that no one could with safety pass the gates of the town. Soon it was not even safe within them. No house, no castle availed the defense. Right and justice no longer existed. Money, fares, Pleasure ruled supreme. Still the gold was melting, as in a furnace, at these fetes, and by heaven's just punishment, Alexander and Caesar were beginning to combat the fortunes of those very men who had risen through their simony to the present elevation. The first attempt at a new method of coining money was tried upon the Cardinal Cochenza. The occasion was as follows. A certain dispensation had been granted some time before to a nun who had taken the vows. She was the only surviving hire to the throne of Portugal, 
and by means of the dispensation she had been wedded to the natural son of the last king. This marriage was more prejudicial than can easily be imagined to the interests of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. So they sent ambassadors to Alexander to lodge a complaint against a proceeding of this nature, especially as it happened at the very moment when an alliance was to be formed between the House of Aragon and the Holy See. Alexander understood the complaint and resolved that all should be set right, so he denied all knowledge of the papal brief, though he had as a fact received 60,000 ducats for signing it, and accused the Archbishop of Cochenza, secretary for apostolic briefs, of having granted a false dispensation. By reason of this accusation, the Archbishop was taken to the castle of St. Angelo, and a suit was begun. But as it was no easy task to prove an accusation of this nature, especially if the Archbishop should persist in maintaining that the dispensation was really granted by the Pope, it was resolved to employ a trick with him which could not fail to succeed. One evening the Archbishop of Cochenza saw Cardinal Valentino come into his prison. With that frank air of affability which he well knew how to assume when it could serve his purpose, he explained to the prisoner the embarrassing situation in which the Pope was placed, from which the Archbishop alone, whom His Holiness looked upon as his best friend, could save him. The Archbishop replied that he was entirely at the service of His Holiness. Caesar, on his entrance, found the captive seated, leaning his elbows on the table, and he took a seat opposite him and explained the Pope's position. It was an embarrassing one. At the very time of contracting so important an alliance with the House of Aragon as that of Lucrezia and Alfonso, His Holiness could not avow to Ferdinand and Isabella that, for the sake of a few miserable ducats, he had signed a dispensation which would unite in the husband and wife together all the legitimate claims to a throne to which Ferdinand and Isabella had no right at all but that of conquest. This avowal would necessarily put an end to all negotiations, and the pontifical house would fall by the overthrow of that very pedestal which was to have heightened its grandeur. Accordingly, the archbishop would understand that the pope expected of his devotion and friendship. It was a simple and straight avowal that he had supposed he might take it upon himself to accord the dispensation. Then, as the sentence to be passed on such an error would be the business of Alexander, the accused could easily imagine beforehand how truly paternal such a sentence would be. Besides, the reward was in the same hands, as if the sentence was that of a father, the recompense would be that of a king. In fact, this recompense would be no less than the honor of assisting as envoy, with the title of cardinal, at the marriage of Lucrezia and Alfonso, a favor which would be very appropriate, since it would be thanks to his devotion that the marriage could take place. The Archbishop of Cochenza knew the men he was dealing with. He knew that to save their own hand ends, they would hesitate at nothing. He knew they had a poison-like sugar to the taste and to the smell impossible to discover in food, a poison that would kill slowly or quickly, as the poisoner willed, and would leave no trace behind. He knew the secret of the poison key that lay always on the Pope's mantelpiece, so that when His Holiness wished to destroy some one of his intimates, he bade him open a certain cupboard. On the handle of the key there was a little spike, and as the lock of the cupboard turned stiffly, the hand would naturally press, the lock would yield, and nothing would have come of it but a trifling scratch. The scratch was mortal. He knew, too, that Caesar wore a ring made like two lions' head, and that he would turn the stone on the inside when he was shaking hands with a friend. Then the lions' teeth became the teeth of a viper, and the friend died cursing Borgia. So he yielded, partly through fear, partly blinded by the thought of the reward, and Caesar returned to the Vatican armed with the precious paper, in which the Archbishop of Concenza admitted that he was the only person responsible for the dispensation granted to the royal nun. Two days later, by means of the proofs kindly furnished by the Archbishop, the Pope, 
In the presence of the governor of Rome, the auditor of the apostolic chamber, the advocate, and the fiscal attorney pronounced sentence, condemning the archbishop to the loss of all his benefices and ecclesiastical offices, degradation from his orders, and confiscation of his goods. His person was to be handed over to the civil arm. Two days later, the civil magistrate entered the prison to fulfill his office as received from the Pope, and appeared before the archbishop accompanied by the clerk, two servants, and four guards. The clerk unrolled the paper he carried and read out the sentence. The two servants untied a packet, and, stripping the prisoner of his ecclesiastical garments, they reclothed him in a dress of coarse, white clothes, which only reached down to his knees, breeches of the same, and a pair of clumsy shoes. Lastly, the guards took him and led him into one of the deepest dungeons of the castle of San Angelo, where, for furniture, he found nothing but a wooden crucifix, a table, a chair, and a bed. For occupation, a Bible and a breviary, with a lamp to read by. For nourishment, two pounds of bread and a little cask of water, which were to be renewed every three days, together with a bottle of oil for burning in his lamp. At the end of one year, the poor archbishop died of despair, not before he had known his own arms in his agony. The very same day that he was taken into the dungeon, Caesar Borgia, who had managed the affair so ably, was presented by the Pope with all the belongings of the condemned prisoner. But the hunting parties, balls, and masquerades were not the only pleasures enjoyed by the Pope and his family. From time to time, strange spectacles were exhibited. We will only describe two, one of them a case of punishment, the other no more nor less than a matter of the stud farm. But, at bo but as both of these give details with which we would not have our readers credit of our imagination, we will first say that they are literally translated from Bouchard's Latin journal. About the same time, that is, about the beginning of 1499, a certain courtesan named La Corseta was in prison, and had a lobel who came to visit her in woman's clothes, a Spanish moor called from his disguise the Spanish lady from Barbary. As a punishment, both of them were led through the town, the woman with a petticoat or a skirt, but wearing only the moor's dress unbuttoned in front. The man wore his woman's garb, his hands were tied behind his back, and the skirt fastened up to his middle, with a view to complete exposure before the eyes of all. When in this attire they had made the circuit of the town, the corsetta was sent back to the prison with the moor. But on the 7th of April, following the moor, was again taken out, and escorted in the company of two thieves towards the Campo de Fiori. Three condemned men were then preceded by a constable, who rode backwards on an ass, and held in his hand a long pole, on the end of which were hung, still bleeding, the amputated limbs of a poor Jew, who had suffered torture and death for some trifling crime. When the procession reached the place of execution, the thieves were hanged, and the unfortunate Moor was tied to a stake piled around, round with wood, where he was to have been burnt to death, had not rain fallen in such torrents that the fire would not burn in spite of all the efforts of the executioner. This unlooked-for accident, taken as a miracle by the people, robbed Lucrezia of the most exciting part of the execution. But her father was holding in reserve another kind of a spectacle to console her with later. We inform the reader once more that a few lines we are about to set before him are a translation from the journal of the worthy German Bouchard, who saw nothing in the bloodiest of most wanton performances but facts for his journal, which he duly registered, with the impassibility of a scribe, appending no remark or moral reflection. On the 11th of November, a certain peasant was entering Rome with two stallions laden with wood, with the servants of his holiness, just as he passed the piazza of St. Peter's, cut their girts, so that their loads fell on the ground with the pack saddles, and led off the horses to a court between the palace and the gate. Then the stable doors were opened, and four stallions, quite free and unbridled, 
rushed out and in an instant all six animals began kicking biting and fighting each other until several were killed Roderigo and madame lucrezia who sat at the window just over the palace gate took the greatest delight in the struggle and called their courtiers to witness the gallant battle that was being fought below them now caesar's trick in the matter of the archbishop of cochenza had had the desired result and isabella and ferdinand could no longer impute to alexander the signature of the brief they had complained of of so nothing was now in the way of the marriage of lucretia and alfonso this certainly gave the pope great joy for he attached all the more importance to this marriage because he was already cogitating a second between caesar and doña carlota frederick's daughter caesar had shown in all his actions since his brother's death his want for vocation for the ecclesiastical life so no one was astonished when a consistory having been summoned one morning by alexander caesar entered and addressing the pope began by saying that from his earliest years he had been drawn toward secular pursuits both by natural inclination and ability and it had only been in obedience to the absolute commands of his holiness that he entered the church accepted the cardinal's scarlet other dignities and finally the sacred order of the diaconate but feeling that in his situation it was improper to follow his passions and at his age impossible to resist them he humbly entreated his holiness graciously to yield to the desire he had failed to overcome and to permit him to lay aside the dress and dignities of the church and enter once more into the world there there to contract a lawful marriage also he entreated the lord cardinals to intercede for him with his holiness to whom he would freely resign all his churches abbeys and benefices as well as every other ecclesiastical dignity and preferment that had been accorded him the cardinals deferring to caesar's wishes gave a unanimous vote and the pope as we might suppose like a good father not wishing to force his son's inclinations accepted his resignation and yielded to the petition thus caesar put off the scarlet robe which was suited to him says his historian tommaso tomasi in one particular only that it was the color of blood in truth the resignation was a pressing necessity and there was no time to lose charles the eighth one day after he had come home late and tired from the hunting field had bathed his head in cold water and going straight to table had been struck down by an apoplectic seizure directly after his supper and was dead leaving the throne to the good louis the twelfth a man of two conspicuous weaknesses one as the probable as the other the first was the wish to make conquests the second was the desire to have children alexander who was on the watch for all political changes had seen in a moment what he could get from louis the second the twelfth accession to the throne and was prepared to profit by the fact that the new king of france needed his help for the accomplishment of his twofold desire louis needed first his temporal aid in an expedition against the Duchy of milan on which as we explained before he had inherited claims from valentina visconti his grandmother and secondly his spiritual aid to dissolve his marriage with jeanne the daughter of louis the eleventh a childless and hideously deformed woman who he had uh, only married by reason of the great fear he entertained for her father now alexander was willing to do all this for louis the twelfth and to give an addiction in addition a cardinal's hat to his friend george d'amboise provided only that the king of france would use his influence in persuading the young doña carlota who was at his court to marry his son caesar so as this business was already far advanced on the day when caesar doffed his scarlet and donned the secular garb thus fulfilling the ambition so long cherished when the lord of villeneuve sent by louis and commissioned to bring caesar to france presented himself before the ex-cardinal on his arrival at rome the latter with his usual extravagance of luxury and the kindness he knew well how to bestow on those he needed entertained his guest for a month and did all the honors of rome 
After that, they departed, preceded by one of the pop's couriers, who gave orders that every town they passed through was to receive them with marks of honor and respect. The same order had been set throughout the whole of France, where the illustrious visitors received so numerous a guard, and were welcomed by a populace so eager to behold them, that after they passed through Paris, Caesar's gentlemen in waiting wrote to Rome that they had not seen any trees in France, or houses, or walls, but only men, women, and sunshine. The king, on the pretext of going out hunting, went to meet his guest two leagues outside the town. As he knew Caesar was very fond of the name of Valentine, which he had used as cardinal, and still continued to employ with the title of count, although he had resigned the archbishop which gave him the name, he there and then bestowed on him the investiture of Belenz in Dauphine with the title of duke and a pension of twenty thousand francs. Then, when he had made this magnificent gift and talked with him for nearly a couple of hours, he took his leave to enable him to prepare the splendid entry he was proposing to make. It was Wednesday, the 18th of December, 1498, when Caesar Borgia entered the town of Chinon, with pomp worthy of the son of a pop who is about to marry the daughter of a king. The procession began with four and twenty mules, caparisoned in red, adorned with escutcheons bearing the duke's arms, laden with carved trunks and chests inlaid with ivory and silver. After them came four and twenty mare, also caparisoned, this time in the library of the king of France, yellow and red. Next, after this, came ten or the mules, covered in yellow satin with red crossbars, and lastly another ten, covered with striped cloth of gold, the stripes alternatively ranged in flat gold. Behind the seventy mules, which led the procession, there pranced sixteen handsome battle horses, laid by equerries who marched alongside. These were followed by eighteen hunters ridden by eighteen pages, who were about fourteen or fifteen years of age. Sixteen of them were dressed in crimson velvet, and two in raised cold cloth. So elegantly dressed were these two children, who were also the best looking of the little band, that the sight of them gave rise to strange suspicions as to the reasons for this preference, if one may believe what Branton says. Finally, behind these eighteen horses came six beautiful mules, all harnessed with red velvet, and led by six ballets, also in velvet to match. The third group consisted of, first, two mules quite covered with cloves of gold, each carrying two chests, in which it was said that the duke's treasure was stored, the precious stones he was bringing to his fiancée, and the relics and papal bulls that his father had cherished to convey from him to Louis the Twelfth. These were followed by twenty gentlemen dressed in clothes of gold and silver, among whom rode Paul Giorgiano Orsino, and several barons and knights among the chiefs of the estate ecclesiastic. Next came two drums, one rebec, and four soldiers blowing trumpets and silver clarions. Then, in the midst of a party of four and twenty lackeys, dressed half in crimson, velvet and half in yellow silk, rode Messier George d'Amboise and Monseigneur the Duke of Valentinois. Caesar was mounted on a handsome tall courser, very richly harnessed, in a row half rain satin and a half cloth of gold, embroidered all over with pearls and precious stones. In his cap were two rows of rubies, the size of beans, which reflected so brilliant a light that one might have fancied they were the famous carbuncles of the Arabian nates. He also wore on his neck a collar worth at least two hundred thousand livres. Indeed, there was no part of him, even down to his boots, that was not laced with gold and edged with pearls. His horse was covered with a curious, in a pattern of golden foliage of wonderful warmership among which there appeared to glow like flowers nosegays of pearls and clusters of rubies lastly bringing up the rear of the magnificent cortege behind the duke 
came twenty-four mules with red caparisons bearing his arms, carrying his silver plate, tents, and baggage. What gave to all the cavalcade an air of most wonderful luxury and extravagance was that the horses and mules were shod with golden shoes, and these were so badly nailed on that more than three-quarters of their number were lost on the road. For this extravagance, Caesar was greatly blamed, for it was thought an audacious thing to put on his horse's feet a metal of which kings and crowns are made. But all this pomp had no effect on the lady for whose sake it had been displayed, for when Doña Carlota was told that Caesar Borgia had come to France in the hope of becoming her husband, she replied simply that she would never take a priest for her husband, and moreover the son of a priest, a man who was not only an assassin, but a fratricide, not only a man of infamous birth, but still more infamous in his morals and his actions. But, in the fault of the haughty lady of Aragon, Caesar soon found another princess of noble blood who consented to be his wife. This was Mademoiselle d'Albret, daughter of the King of Navarre. The marriage, arranged on condition that the Pope should pay 200,000 ducats dowry to the bride, and should make her brother cardinal, was celebrated on the 10th of May, and on the Whit Sunday, following the Dukes of Valentois, received the Order of St. Michael, an order founded by Louis XI, and esteemed at this period as the highest in the gift of the kings of France. The news of this marriage, which made an alliance with Louis XII certain, was received with great joy by the Pope, who at once gave orders, far fires, and illuminations all over the town. Louis XII was not only grateful to the Pope for dissolving his marriage with Jeanne of France, and authorizing his union with Anne of Brittany, but he considered it indispensable to his designs in Italy to have the Pope as his ally. So he promised the Duke of Valentinois to put three hundred lances at his disposal as soon as he had made an entry into Milan to be used to further his own private interests and against whomsoever he pleased except only the allies of France. The conquest of Milan should be undertaken so soon as Louis felt assured of the support of the Venetians, or at least of their neutrality, and he had sent them ambassadors authorized to promise in his name the restoration of Cremona and Guerra Dada when he had completed the conquest of Lombardy. End of section 16《セクション17 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda.《Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1 》by Alexander Dumas. Translated by G.B. Eves, Section 17. The Borgias, Chapter 9. Everything from without was favoring Alexander's encroaching policy when he was compelled to turn his eyes from France towards the center of Italy. In Florence dwelt a man, neither duke, nor king, nor soldier, a man whose power was in his genius, whose armor was his purity, who owed no offensive weapon but his tongue, and who yet began to grow more dangerous for him than all the kings, dukes, princes, and the whole world could ever be. This man was the poor Dominican monk Girolamo Savonarola, the same who had refused absolution to Lorenzo del Medici because he would not restore the liberty of Florence. Girolamo Savonarola had prophesied the invasion of a force from beyond the Alps, and Charles VIII had conquered Naples. Girolamo Savonarola had prophesied to Charles VIII that because he had failed to fulfill the mission of liberator entrusted to him by God, he was threatened with a great misfortune as a punishment, and Charles was dead. Lastly, Savonarola had prophesied his own fall like the man who paced around the holy city for eight days, crying, Woe to Jerusalem, and on the ninth day, woe be on my own head. Nonetheless, the Florentine reformer, who could not recall from any danger, was determined to attack the colossal abomination that was seated on St. Peter's holy throne. 
each debauch, each fresh crime had that lifted up its brazen face to the light of day or tried to hide its shameful head beneath the veil of night he had never failed to paint out to the people denouncing it as the offspring of the pop's luxurious living and lost of power thus had he stigmatized alexander's new amour with the beautiful julia farnese who in the preceding april he added another son to the pop's family thus had he cursed the duke of gandia's murderer the lustful julius fratricide lastly he had pointed out to the florentines who were excluded from the league then forming what sort of future was in store far for them when the borgias should have made themselves masters of small principalities and should come to attack the duques and republics it was clear that in Savonarola the Pope had an enemy at once, temporal and spiritual, whose importunate and threatening voice must be silenced at any cost. But mighty as the Pope's power was, to accomplish a design like this was no easy matter. Savonarola, preaching the stern principles of liberty, had united to his cause, even in the midst of rich, pleasure-loving Florence, a body of some size, known as the Piagnoni, or the penitents. This band was composed of citizens who were anxious for reforming church and state, who accused the Medici of enslaving the fatherland and the Borgias of upsetting the faith, who demanded two things, that the Republic should return to her democratic principles and religion to a primitive simplicity. Towards the first of these projects considerable progress had been made since they had successively obtained first an amnesty for all crimes and delinquencies committed under other governments secondly the abolition of the balia which was an aristocratic magistracy thirdly the establishment of a sovereign council composed of eighteen hundred citizens and lastly the substitution of popular elections for drawing by lot and for oligarchical nominations these changes had been effected in spite of two other factions, the Arabiati, or madmen, who, consisting of the richest and noblest youths of the Florentine patrician families, desired to have an oligarchical government, and the Bigi, or grace, so called because they always held their meetings in the shade, who desired the return of the Medici. The first measure Alexander used against the growing power of Savonarola was to declare him heretic, and as such, banished from the pulpit. But Savonarola had eluded this prohibition by making his pupil and friend, Domenico Bombicini di Pescia, preach in his stead. The result was that the master's teachings were issued from other lips, and that was all. The seed, though scattered by another hand, fell nonetheless on fertile soil, where it would soon burst into flower. Moreover, Savonarola now set an example that was followed to good purpose by Luther, when, twenty-two years later, he burned Leo's the tents, bold of excommunication at Wittenberg. He was weary of silence, so he declared, on the authority of Pope Pelagius, that an unjust excommunication had no efficacy, and that the person excommunicated unjustly did not even need to get absolution. So, on Christmas Day, 1497, he declared that, by the inspiration of God, he renounced his obedience to a corrupt master, and he began to preach once more in the cathedral, with a success that was all the greater for the interruption, and an influence far more formidable than before, because it was strengthened by that sympathy of the masses which an unjust persecution always inspires. Then Alexander made overtures to Leonardo del Medici, vicar of the Archbishopric of Florence, to obtain the punishment of the rebel, Leonardo. In obedience to the orders he received from Rome, issued a mandate forbidding the faithful to attend at Savonarola's sermons. After this mandate, any who should hear the discourses of the excommunicated monk would be refused communion and confession, and as when they died they would be contaminated with heresy in consequence of their spiritual intercourse with a heretic, their dead bodies would be dragged on a hurdle and deprived of the rites of sepulture. Savonarola appealed from the mandate of his superior both to the people and to the signoria, and the two together gave orders to the episcopal vicar to leave Florence within two hours. This happened at the beginning of the year 1498. 
The expulsion of Leonard's de Medici was a tr new triumph for Savonarola, so, wishing to turn to good moral account his growing influence, he resolved to convert the last day of the carnival, hereto given up to worldly pleasures, into a day of religious sacrifice. So, actually, on Shrub Tuesday, a considerable number of boys were collected in front of the cathedral, and there divided into bands, which traversed the whole town, making a house-to-house -house visitation, claiming all profane books, licentious paintings, lutes, harps, cards and dice, cosmetics and perfumes. In a word, all the hundreds of products of a corrupt society and civilization, by the aid of which Satan at times makes victorious war on God. The inhabitants of Florence obeyed, and came forth to the piazza of the Duoma, bringing these works of perdition, which were soon piled up in a huge sack, which the youthful reformers set on fire, singing religious psalms and hymns the while. On this pile were burned many copies of Boccaccio and of Morangante Maggiore, and pictures of Fra Bartolomeo, who from that day forward renounced the art of this world to consecrate his brush utterly and entirely to the reproduction of religious sins. A reform such as this was terrifying to Alexander, so he resolved on fighting Savonarola with his own weapons, that is, by the force of eloquence. He chose as the Dominican's opponent a preacher of recognized talent called Fra Francesco di Paglia, and he sent him to Florence, where he began to preach in Santa Croce, accusing Savonarola of heresy and impiety. At the same time, the Pope, in a new brief, announced that to the Signoria that unless they forbade the arch heretic to preach, all the goods of Florentine merchants who lived on the papal territory would be confiscated, and the Republic laid on an interdict and declared the spiritual and temporal enemy of the Church. The Signoria, abandoned by France, and aware that the material power of Rome was increasing in a frightful manner, was forced to this time to yield, and to issue to Savonarola an order to leave off preaching. He obeyed and bade farewell to his congregation in a sermon full of strength and eloquence. But the withdrawal of Savonarola, so far from calming the ferment, had increased it. There was talk about his prophecies being fulfilled, and some zealots, more ardent than their mastery added miracle to inspiration, and loudly proclaimed that Savonarola had offered to go down into the vaults of the cathedral with his antagonist, and there bring a dead man to life again, to prove that his doctrine was true, promising to declare himself vanquished if the miracle were performed by his adversary. These rumors reached the ears of Fra Francesco, and as he was a man of warm blood, who counted his own life as nothing if it might be spent to help his cause, he declared in all humility that he felt he was too great a sinner for God to work a miracle in his behalf. But he proposed another challenge. He would try with Savonarola the ordeal of fire. He knew, he said, that he must perish, but at least he should perish avenging the cause of religion, since he was certain to involve in his destruction the tempter who plunged so many souls, beside his own, into eternal damnation. The proposition made by Fra Francesco was taken to Savonarola, but as he had never proposed the earlier challenge, he hesitated to accept the second. Hereupon his disciple, Fra Domenico Bombicini, more confident than his master in his own power, declared himself ready to accept the trial by fire in his stead. So certain was he that God would perform a miracle by the intercession of Savonarola, his prophet. Instantly the report spread to Florence that the mortal challenge was accepted. Savonarola's partisans, all men of the strongest convictions, felt no doubt as to the success of their cause. His enemies were enchanted at the thought of the heretic giving himself to the flames, and the indifference saw in the ordeal a spectacle of real and terrible interest. But the devotion of Fra Bombicini of Pescia was not what Fra Francesco was reckoning with. He was willing, no doubt, to die a terrible death, but on condition that Savonarola died with them. What mattered to him the death of an obscure disciple like Fra Bombincini? 
It was the master he would strike, the great teacher who must be involved in his own ruin. So he refused to enter the fire except with Savonarola himself, and, playing this terrible game in his own person, would not allow his adversary to play it by proxy. Then a thing happened which certainly no one could have anticipated. In the place of Fra Francesco, who would not tilt with any but the master, two Franciscan monks appeared to tilt with the disciple. These were Fra Nicolas de Pili and Fra Andrea Rondinelli. Immediately, the partisans of Savonarola, seeing this arrival of reinforcements for their antagonist, came forward in a crowd to try the ordeal. The Franciscans were unwilling to be behindhand, and everybody looked, took sides with equal ardor for one or another party. All Florence was like a den of madmen. Everyone wanted the ordeal, everyone wanted to go into the fire. Not only did men challenge one another, but women and even children were clamoring to allow to try. At last the Signoria, reserving this privilege for the first applicants, ordered that the strange duel should take place only between Fra Domenico Bombincini and Fra Andrea Rondinelli. Ten of the citizens were to arrange all the details. The date for the 7th of April, 1498, and the place, the Piazza del Palazzo. The judges of the field made their arguments conscientiously. By their orders, a scaffolding was erected at the appointed place, five feet in height, ten in width, and eight feet long. This scaffolding was covered with fagots and heat, supported by crossbars of the very driest wood that could be found. Two narrow paths were made, two feet wide at most, their entrance given, and the loggia dei Lanzi, their exit exactly opposite. The loggia was itself divided into two by a partition, so that each champion had a kind of room to make his preparations in, just as in the theater every actor has his dressing room. But in this instance the tragedy was about to be played was not a fictitious one. The Franciscans arrived in the piazza and entered the compartment reserved for them without making any religious demonstration, while Savonarola, on the contrary, advanced to his own place in the procession, wearing the sacerdotal robes in which he had just celebrated the Holy Eucharist, and holding in his hand the sacred host for all the world to see, as it was enclosed in a crystal tabernacle, Fra Domenico di Pecia, the hero of the occasion, followed, bearing a crucifix, and all the Dominican monks, their red crosses in their hands, marched behind, singing a psalm, while behind them again followed the most considerable of the citizens of their party, bearing torches, for sure as they were the triumph of their cause, they wished to fire the fagots themselves. The piazza was so crowded that the people overflowed into all the streets around. In every door and window there was nothing to be seen but heads ranged one above the other. The terraces were covered with people, and curious spectators were observed at the roof of the Duomo and on the top of the Campanile. But, fra, brought, but fra face to face with the ordeal, the Franciscans raised such difficulties that it was very plain the heart of their champion was failing him. The first fear they expressed was that Fra Bombincini was an enchanter, and so carried about him some talisman of charm which would save him from the fire. So they insisted that he should be stripped of all his clothes and put on others to be inspected by witnesses. Fra Bombincini made no objection, though the suspicion was humiliating. He changed shirt, dress, and cowl. Then, when the Franciscans observed that Savonarola was placing the tabernacle in his hands, they protested that it was profanation to expose the sacred house to the risk of burning, that this was not in the bond, and in Bombincini would not give up his supernatural aid. They far their part would give up the trial altogether. Savonarola replied that this was not astonishing that the champion of religion who put his faith in God should bear in his hands that very God to whom he entrusted his salvation. But this reply did not satisfy the Franciscans, who were unwilling to let go of their contention. Savonarola remained inflexible, supporting his own right, and thus nearly four hours passed in the discussion of points which neither party would give up and affairs remained in statu quo. 
Meanwhile, the people, jammed together in the streets, on the terraces, on the roofs, since break of day, were suffering from hunger and thirst and beginning to get impatient. Their impatience soon developed into loud murmurs, which reached even the champions' ears, so that the partisans of Savonarola, who felt such faith in him that they were confident of a miracle, entreated him to yield to all the suggestions condition, su conditions suggested. To this, Savonarola replied that if it were himself making the trial, he would be less inexorable, but since another man was incurring the danger, he could not take too many precautions. Two more hours passed, while his partisans tried in vain to combat his refusals. At last, as night was coming on, and the people grew even more and more impatient, and their murmurs began to assume a threatening tone, Bombinchini declared that he was ready to walk through the fire, holding nothing in his hands but a crucifix. No one could refuse him this, so Fra Rondinelli was compelled to accept his proposition. The announcement was made to the populace that the champions had come to terms and the trial was about to take place. At this news the people calmed down in the hope of being compensated at last for the long wait. But at that very moment a storm which had long been threatening break over Florence with such fury that the fagots which had just been lighted were extinguished by the rain, leaving no possibility of their rekindling. From the moment when the people suspected that they had been fooled, their enthusiasm was changed into derision. They were ignorant from which side the difficulties had arisen that had hindered the trial. So they laid the responsibility on both champions without distinction. The Signoria, foreseeing the disorder that was now imminent, ordered the assembly to retire. But the assembly thought otherwise and stayed on the piazza, waiting for the departure of the two champions, in spite of the fearful rain that still fell in torrents. Rondinelli was taken back amid shouts and hootings, and pursued with showers of stones. Savonarola, thanks to his sacred garments and the host which he still carried, passed calmly enough through the midst of a mob, a miracle quite as remarkable as if he had passed through the fire unscathed. But it was only the sacred majesty of the host that protected this man, who was indeed from this moment regarded as a false prophet. The crowd allowed Savonarola to return to his convent, but they regretted the necessity, so excited were they by the Arrabiati party, who had always denounced him as a liar and a hypocrite. So when the next morning, Palm Sunday, he stood up in the pulpit to explain his conduct, he could not obtain a moment's silence from insults, hooting, and loud laughter. Then the outcry, at first derisive, became menacing. Savonarola, whose voice was too weak to subdue the tumult, descended from his pulpit, retired into the sacristy, and thence to his convent, where he shut himself up in his cell. At the moment, a cry was heard, and was repeated to everybody present. To San Marco! To San Marco! The rioters, few at first, were recruited by all the populace as they swept along the streets, and at last reached the convent, dashing like an angry sea against the wall. The doors, closed on Savonarola's entrance, soon crashed before the vehement onset of the powerful multitude, which struck down on the instant every obstacle it met. The whole convent was quickly flooded with people, and Savonarola, with two of his confederates, Domenico Bombincini and Silvestro Maruffi, was arrested in his cell and conducted to prison amid the insults of the crowd, who, always in extremes, whether of enthusiasm or hatred, would have liked to tear them to pieces, and would not be quieted till they had exacted the promise that the prisoners should be forcibly compelled to make the trial of fire which they had refused to make of their own free will. Alexander the Sixth, as we may suppose, had not been without influence in bringing about this sudden and astonishing reaction, although he was not present in person, and had scarcely learned the news of Savonarola's fall and arrest when he claimed him as subject to ecclesiastical jurisdiction. But in spite of the grant of indulgences wherewith this demand was accompanied, the Signoria insisted that Savonarola's trial should take place at Florence, adding a request so as to not appear to withdraw the accused completely from the pontifical authority, that the Pope would send two ecclesiastical judges to sit in the Florentine tribunal. 
Alexander, seeing that he would get nothing better from the magnificent republic, sent as deputies Giocaccino Turriano Benich, general of the Dominicans, and Francesco Ramolini, doctor in law. They practically brought the sentence with them, declaring Savonarola and his accomplices heretics, schismatics, persecutors of the church, and seducers of the people. The firmness shown by the Florentines in claiming the rights of jurisdiction were nothing but an empty show to save appearances. The tribunal, as a fact, was composed of eight members, all known to be fervent haters of Savonarola, whose trial began with the torture. The result was that, feeble in body, constitutionally nervous and irritable, he had not been able to endure the rack, and, overcome by agony, just at the moment when the executioner had lifted him, him up by the wrists and then dropped him at a distance of two feet to the ground, he had confessed, in order to get some respite, that his prophecies were nothing mere than more conjectures. If it is true that so soon as he went back to prison, he protested against the confession, saying that it was the weakness of his bodily organs and his wanton firmness that had rested the life from him, but that the truth really was that the Lord had several times appeared to him in his ecstasies and revealed the things that he had spoken. This protestation led to a new application of the torture, during which Savonarola succumbed once more to the dreadful pain, and once more retracted. But scarcely was he unbound, and was still lying on the bed of torture, when he declared that his confessions were the fault of his tortures, and the vengeance would recall upon their heads. And he protested yet once more against all he had confessed and might confess again. A third time the torture produced the same avowals, and the relief that followed it the same retractions. The judges, therefore, when they condemned him and his two disciples to the flames, decided that his confession should not be read aloud at the stake, according to custom, feeling certain that, in this occasion, also he would give it the lie, and that publicly, which, as any one must see who knew the versatile spirit of the public, would be a most dangerous proceeding. On the 23rd of May, the fire which had been promised to the people before was a second time prepared on the Piazza del Palazzo, and this time the crowd assembled quite certain that they would not be disappointed of a spectacle so long anticipated. And towards eleven o'clock in the morning, Girolamo Savonarola, Domenico Bombicini, and Silvestro Maruffi were led to the place of execution, the greater of their orders by the ecclesiastical judges, and bound all three to the same stake in the center of an immense pile of wood. Then the bishop Pagnanoli told the condemned men that he cut them off from the church. I, from the church militant, said Savonarola, who from that very hour, thanks to his martyrdom, was entering into the church triumphant. No other words were spoken by the condemned men, for at this moment one of the Arab Yari, a personal enemy of Savonarola, breaking through the hedge of guards around the scaffold, snatched the torch from the executioner's hand and himself set fire to the four corners of the pile. Savonarola and his prince disciples, from the moment when they saw the smoke arise, began to sign a psalm. And the flames enwrapped them on all sides with a glowing bile, and the religious song was yet heard mounting upward to the gates of heaven. Pope Alexander VI was thus set free from perhaps the most formidable enemy who had ever risen against them, and the pontifical vengeance pursued the victims even after their death. The Signoria, yielding to his wishes, gave orders that the ashes of the prophet and his disciples should be thrown into the Arno. But certain half-burned fragments were picked up by the very soldiers whose business it was to keep the people back from approaching the fire, and the holy relics are even now shown, blackened by the flames, to the faithful, who, if they no longer regard Savonarola as a prophet, revere him none the less as a martyr. End of section 17 of celebrated crimes volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by julie famalliam 
Celebrated Crimes, Volume 1, by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by G. B. Ives. Section 18. The Borgias. Chapter 10. Part 1. The French army was now preparing to cross the Alps a second time, under the command of Trivuls. Louis the Twelfth had come as far as Lyon in the company of Cesar Borgia and Giuliano della Rovere, in whom he had forced a reconciliation, and towards the beginning of the month of May had sent his vanguard before him, soon to be followed by the main body of the army. The forces he was employing in the second campaign of conquest were sixteen hundred lances, five thousand Swiss, nine thousand Gascons, and three thousand five hundred infantry, raised from all parts of France. On the thirteenth of August, this whole body, amounting to nearly fifteen thousand men, who were to combine their forces with the Venetians, arrived beneath the walls of Arezzo and immediately laid siege to the town. Ludovico Sforza's position was a terrible one. He was now suffering from his imprudence in calling the French into Italy. All the allies he had thought he might count upon were abandoning him at the same moment, either because they were busy about their own affairs, or because they were afraid of the powerful enemy that the Duke of Milan had made for himself. Maximilian, who had promised him a contribution of four hundred lances to make up for not renewing the hostilities with Louis the Twelfth, that had been interrupted, had just made a liege with the circle of Swabia to war against the Swiss, whom he had declared rebels against the empire. The Florentines, who had engaged to furnish him with three hundred men-at-arms and two thousand infantry, if he would help them to retake Pisa, had just retracted their promise because of Louis the Twelfth's threats, and had undertaken to remain neutral. Frederick, who was holding back his troops for the defence of his own states, because he supposed, not without reason, that, Milan once conquered, he would again have to defend Naples, sent him no help, no men, no money, in spite of his promises. Ludovico Sforza, was therefore reduced to his own proper forces. But as he was a man powerful in arms and clever in artifice, he did not allow himself to succumb at the first blow, and in all haste fortified Anonna, Novarro, and Alessandria, sent off Gaggiazzo with troops to that part of the Milanese territory which borders on the state of Venice, and collected on the Po as many troops as he could. These precautions availed him nothing against the impetuous onslaught of the French, who in a few days had taken Anonna, Arezzo, Novaro, Vogera, Casalnuovo, Ponte Corona, Tartone, and Alessandria, while Trivuls was on the march to Milan. Seeing the rapidity of this conquest and their numerous victories, Ludovico Sforza, despairing of holding out in his capital, resolved to retire to Germany, with his children, his brother, Cardinal Ascanio Sforza, and his treasure, which had been reduced in the course of eight years, from one and a half million to two hundred ducats. But before he went, he left Bernardino da Carte in charge of the castle of Milan. In vain did his friends warn him to distrust this man. In vain did his brother Ascanio offer to hold the fortress himself, and offer to hold it to the very last. Ludovico refused to make any change in his arrangements, and started on the 2nd of September, leaving in the citadel three thousand foot, and enough provisions, ammunition, and money to sustain a siege of several months. Two days after Ludovico's departure, the French entered Milan. Ten days later, Bernardino da Carte gave up the castle before a single gun had been fired. Twenty-one days had sufficed for the French to get possession of the various towns, the capital, and all the territories of their enemy. Louis XII received the news of this success while he was at Lyon, 
and he at once started for Milan, where he was received with demonstrations of joy that were really sincere. Citizens of every rank had come out three miles distant from the gates to receive him, and forty boys, dressed in cloth of gold and silk, marched before him, singing hymns of victory, composed by poets of the period, in which the king was styled their liberator and the envoy of freedom. The great joy of the Milanese people was due to the fact that friends of Louis had been spreading reports beforehand that the king of France was rich enough to abolish all taxes, and so soon as the second day from his arrival at Milan, the conqueror made some slight reduction, granted important favours to certain Milanese gentlemen, and bestowed the town of Bigavano on Trivuls as a reward for his swift and glorious campaign. But Cesar Borgia, who had followed Louis XII with a view to playing his part in the great hunting ground of Italy, scarcely waited for him to attain his end, when he claimed the fulfilment of his promise, which the king, with his accustomed loyalty, hastened to perform. He instantly put at the disposal of Cesar three hundred lances under the command of Yves d'Allegre, and four thousand Swiss under the command of the bailiff of Dijon, as a help in his work of reducing the vicars of the church. We must now explain to our readers who these new personages were, whom we introduce upon the scene by the above name. During the eternal wars of Galbs and Ghibellines, and the long exile of the popes at Avignon, most of the towns and fortresses of the Romagna had been usurped by petty tyrants, who, for the most part, had received from the empire the investiture of their new possessions. But ever since German influence had retired beyond the Alps, and the popes had again made Rome the centre of the Christian world, all the small princes, robbed of their original protector, had rallied round the papal see, and received at the hands of the Pope a new investiture, and now they paid annual dues, for which if they received the particular title of Duke, Count, or Lord, and the general name of Vicar of the Church. It had been no difficult matter for Alexander, scrupulously examining the actions and behaviour of these gentlemen during the seven years that had elapsed since he was exalted to St. Peter's throne, to find in the conduct of each one of them something that could be called an infraction of the treaty between vessels and suzerain. Accordingly, he brought forward his complaints at a tribunal established for the purpose, and obtained sentence from the judges, to the effect that the vicars of the church, having failed to fulfil the conditions of their investiture, were despoiled of their domains, which would again become the property of the Holy See. As if the Pope was now dealing with men against whom it was easier to pass a sentence than to get it carried out, he had nominated as Captain-General the new Duke of Valentinois, who was commissioned to recover the territories for his own benefit. The lords in question were the Maladesti of Rimini, the Sforza of Pesaro, the Manfredi of Fenza, the Riari of Imola and Farli, the Variani of Camerina, the Montefeltri of Urbino, and the Cetani of Sermoneta. But the Duke of Valentinois, eager to keep as warm as possible his great friendship with his ally and relative Louis the Twelfth, was, as we know, staying with him at Milan so long as he remained there, where, after a month's occupation, the king retraced his steps to his own capital. The Duke of Valentinois ordered his men at arms, and his Swiss to await him between Parma and Modena, and departed post haste for Rome, to explain his plans to his father, Viva Voce, and to receive his final instructions. When he arrived, he found that the fortune of his sister Lucrezia had been greatly augmented in his absence, not from the side of her husband Alfonso, whose future was very uncertain now in consequence of Louise's successes, which had caused some coolness between Alfonso and the Pope, but from her father's side, 
upon whom at this time she exercised an influence more astonishing than ever. The Pope had declared Lucretia Borgia of Aragon, life governor of Spoleto, and its duchy, with all emoluments, rights, and revenues accruing thereunto. This had so greatly increased her power and improved her position that in these days she never showed herself in public without a company of two hundred horses ridden by the most illustrious ladies and noblest knights of Rome. Moreover, as a twofold affection of her father was a secret to nobody, the first relate him the church, the frequenters of the Vatican, the friends of his holiness, were all her most humble servants. Cardinals gave her their hands when she stepped from her litter or her horse. Archbishop disputed the honour of celebrating Mass in her private apartments. But Lucretia had been obliged to quit Rome in order to take possession of her new estates, and as her father could not spend much time away from his beloved daughter, he resolved to take into his hands the town of Nepi, which on a former occasion, as the reader will doubtless remember, he had bestowed on Ascanio Sforza in exchange for his suffrage. Ascanio had naturally lost this town when he attached himself to the fortunes of the Duke of Milan, his brother, and when the Pope was about to take it again, he invited his daughter Lucrezia to join him there and be present at the rejoicings held in honour of his resuming its possession. Lucrezia's readiness in giving way to her father's wishes brought her a new gift from him. This was a town and territory of Sermoneta, which belonged to the Cetani. Of course the gift was yet a secret, because the two owners of the signori had first to be disposed of, one being Monsignore Giacomo Cetano, apostolic pronotary, the other Prospero Cetano, a young cavalier of great promise, but as both lived at Rome, and entertained no suspicion, but indeed supposed themselves to be in high favour with his holiness, the one by virtue of his position, the other of his courage, the matter seemed to present no great difficulty. So, directly after the return of Alexander to Rome, Giacomo Cetano was arrested, on what pretext we know not, was taken to the castle of Sant'Angelo, and there died shortly after of poison. Prospero Cetano was strangled in his own house. After these two deaths, which, which both occurred so suddenly as to give no time for either to make a will, the people declared that Ser Moneta and, and all of her property appertaining to the Cetani devolved upon the apostolic chamber, and they were sold to Lucretia for the sum of eighty thousand crowns, which her father refunded to her the day after. Though Cesar hurried to Rome, he found when he arrived that his father had been beforehand with him, and had made the beginning of his conquests. Another fortune also had been making prodigious strides during Cesar's stay in France, viz. the fortune of John Borgia, the Pope's nephew, who had been one of the most devoted friends of the Duke of Gandia up to the time of his death. It was said in Rome, and not in a whisper, that the young cardinal owed the favours heaped upon him by his holiness less to the memory of the brother than to the protection of the sister. Both these reasons made John Borgia a special object of suspicion to Cesar, and it was with an inward vow that he should not enjoy his new dignities very long, that the Duke of Valentinois heard that his cousin John had just been nominated Cardinal Alatere of all the Christian world, and had quitted Rome to make a circuit through all the pontifical states with a suit of archbishops, bishops, prelates, and gentlemen, such as would have done honour to the Pope himself. Cesar had only come to Rome to get news, so he only stayed three days, and then, with all the troops his holiness could supply, rejoined his forces on the borders of the Udza, and marched at once to Imola. This town, abandoned by its chiefs, who had retired to Forli, was forced to capitulate, Imola taken, 
Jesar marched straight upon Forli. There he met with a serious check, a check, moreover, which came from a woman, Caterina Sforza, widow of Girolamo and mother of Ottaviano Riario, had retired to this town and stirred up the courage of the garrison by putting herself, her goods, and her person under their protection. Cesar saw that it was no longer a question of a sudden capture, but of a regular siege, so he began to make all his arrangements with a view to it, and placing a battery of cannon in front of the place where the wall seemed to him the weakest, he ordered an uninterrupted fire to be continued until the breach was practicable. When he returned to the camp after giving this order, he found there Gian Borgia, who had gone to Rome from Ferrara, and was unwilling to be so near Cesar, without paying him a visit. He was received with effusion, and apparently the greatest joy, and stayed three days. On the fourth day, all the officers and members of the court were invited to a grand farewell supper, and Cesar bade farewell to his cousin, charging him with dispatches for the Pope, and lavishing upon him all the tokens of affection he had shown on his arrival. Cardinal Gian Borgia posted off as soon as he left the supper-table, but on arriving at Urbino he was seized with a, such a sudden and strange indisposition that he was forced to stop. But after a few minutes, feeling rather better, he went on. Scarcely, however, had he entered Rocca Cantrara, when he again felt so extremely ill that he resolved to go no farther, and stayed a couple of days in the town. And then, as he thought he was a little better again, and as he had heard the news of the taking of Forli, and also that Caterina Sforza had been taken prisoner while she was making an attempt to retire into the castle, he resolved to go back to Cesar and congratulate him on this victory. But at Fasambrane he was forced to stop a third time, although he had given up his carriage for a litter. This was his last halt. The same day he sought his bed, never to rise from it again. Three days later he was dead. His body was taken to Rome and buried without any ceremony in the church of Santa Maria del Popolo, where lay awaiting him the corpse of his friend, the Duke of Gandia, and there was now no more talk of the young cardinal, high as his rank had been, than if he had never existed. Thus, in gloom and silence, passed away all those who were swept to destruction by the ambition of that terrible trio, Alexander, Lucrezia, and Cesar. End of section 18